Imagine you have a metal ball with a radius of 1 meter somewhere in space. Such a ball would weigh around 33 metric tons. Now the ball starts moving, and in special relativity there is the concept of the so-called relativistic mass, which is given by the stationary mass of the ball times the gamma factor. So you can imagine that if the velocity of the ball becomes too large, the mass will increase so large that this ball becomes a black hole. So does this really happen? But first, let's look at the numbers. Is such speed even realistic? So this is the equation for the so-called Schwarzschild radius, where if you supply the mass of the object, it will tell you how small it would have to be to become a black hole. So if you have a ball with a mass of 33 metric tons, its Schwarzschild radius is around 5 times 10 to the minus 23 meters. To put this into perspective, a proton has a size around 10 to the minus 15 meters. So the black hole would be still around 100 million times smaller. Okay, now let's look at how fast this ball would have to move. So that its Schwarzschild radius is equal to 1 meter. So that the ball would become a black hole. So we put this r to 1 and add a gamma to this equation and so for gamma. And the number we get is exactly the inverse of the previous number. So that will be 2 times 10 to the 22. And now you can extract the velocity out of it, and you will get something very crazy, like 0 point and now 44 nines and then 8 times the speed of light. So I'm not going to use these velocities, but I just use this gamma factor, which is 10 to the 22. This is crazy large speed. We can only hardly imagine that something that massive would travel with such velocity. The maximum speed of protons we have ever detected had a gamma of 10 to the 10. But protons have mass just around 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. But this is just a naive calculation. Because special relativity also teaches us that things in motion contract due to Lorentz contraction. This adds another gamma factor into the game. So while mass increases linearly with gamma, the density of the ball increases with gamma squared. So suddenly, if you did the calculations, you would get that our metal ball should turn into a black hole for gamma around 10 to the 11. This is significant reduction, but it is still one order of magnitude larger than the fastest particle ever recorded. So we can still hardly imagine that there is object of that size traveling at these velocities. But this doesn't save us from the underlying issue, because special relativity also teaches us that all inertial frames are equal, and we can treat each inertial frame as stationary one, and every other as moving. So from the reference frame of the fastest proton in the universe, it would take a metal ball with a radius of 10 meters to turn it into a black hole. This would turn the entire universe into a pile of black holes. And this will be the end of our civilization, right? But talking about the end of the civilization, if you ever find yourself having to rebuild the civilization from the scratch, maybe it would be very nice to have this book around. It's the ultimate guide to rebuild civilization from hungry minds, and it captures all the most important ingenious discoveries of our species throughout the history, starting with the most basic things, like how to make fire or distinguish the poisonous herbs, up to medicine, engineering, games, and even music. Everything important we have achieved so far in this one book. But I'm not trying to imply that our civilization is going to end anytime soon. But this is very interesting reading regardless. And you start to appreciate how inventive the humankind is. Especially in medicine. For example, would you know how to check if you have compatible blood for transfusion? This is a collection of knowledge from many fields. So no wonder that more than 50 professionals had to be involved in this. But Look how beautiful this book is. The cover, the medieval art style and premium made paper. 
This is a blend of history, science, art and design. So are you still looking for the perfect Christmas gift? I think if you know someone very curious, this is the perfect option. So check out the link in the description and you can get nice Christmas discount there. Or scan the QR code. And now back to the video. So we see that there is a huge problem if you take the relativistic mass too literally. And its introduction was one of the most unfortunate things in special relativity. And it created only more confusion than clarity. It is not good to introduce the concept of mass capital M equals to gamma M of moving body for which no clear definition can be given. It is better to introduce no other mass concept than the rest mass M instead of introducing capital M. It is better to mention the expression for momentum and energy of the body in motion. Okay, now let me clarify what is the mass in the first place. If you have an object and you apply certain force to it, it will start to move. But objects have some intrinsic property inside that causes them to resist this change of velocity. So if you apply the same force to different objects, the ones that resist more strongly have a larger mass. So we can say that mass is the intrinsic property of an object that measures the resistance to applied force. Another thing that this intrinsic property causes is the curvature of space-time. Or more simply, it acts with a force to nearby bodies that is given by the Newton's law of gravitation. So if you have a quantity that you call to be mass, it must check out all the boxes. Otherwise, it is not mass. But you can have a quantity that in some situations behave like mass, but it doesn't check out all the boxes. We sometimes call these quantities to be the effective quantities. So the object with large relativistic mass has larger resistance to applied force, but it doesn't cause curvature of space-time. So if you work on some physical system and the only thing that you care about is the object's resistance to applied force, then introducing this relativistic mass can make sense. But if you are also dealing with gravity, then this will completely break up. But how does the relativistic mass causes larger resistance to applied force? If you have a stationary ball and you push it so that the ball accelerates to 1 meters per second, then if the ball is moving at a very high speed, for the same observer, the same push would give less than 1 meters per second because you can only approach the speed of light, but never cross. So the closer you are to the speed of light for a certain observer, the harder it will seem to push the object. This is the mentioned resistance to force, but it doesn't work the way you would think. For static observer, Newton's law looks something like this, where m is stationary mass. If you have an object moving with a large speed in this direction, and you are pushing it in the same direction, the law looks like this. There is a third power in gamma. But if you push it in perpendicular direction, the law looks like this. So the law of motion depends on the direction you are pushing. So you have to be careful even with this. So this notion of relativistic mass is very outdated and you should probably never mention it when you talk about special relativity. You will avoid a lot of confusion. So that being said, it's not that the motion is completely irrelevant when it comes to the formation of black holes. The quantity that determines whether a black hole would form is called the invariant mass. You can check it out on Wikipedia, but simply invariant mass is just the square of the total system's four momenta. And yes, for single particle, it is just its rest mass, regardless of its state of motion. But if you have two particles in motion, it is no longer that simple. If you work out the invariant mass, you would get this expression, where you have this extra relative gamma term, which looks like this. Now, if you have two particles moving with the same velocity in the same direction, then these gammas 
are the same and this part here becomes inverse gamma squared and everything cancels out, leaving you only with this expression. This you can rewrite like this and get rid of the square. So what you would get is that the invariant mass of these two fast moving objects is just the sum of their rest masses. So no black hole formation. But if they had opposite velocities, this relative gamma would look like this. This part grows with the velocity, but also this part. And if the velocity gets really big, the rest masses become negligible. And if they collide, they could potentially create a black hole if they had large enough momenta. And this was the original concern regarding LHC, that during collisions they could create a system with such a large invariant mass that the black hole would form and eat the entire planet. But the invariant mass the LHC can create during one collision is around 13 tera electron volts, which translates to a roughly 2 times 10 to the minus 23 kilograms. But even if this happened and we created such a black hole with a mass of 2 times 10 to the minus 23 kilograms, if the Hawking radiation is correct, this black hole would evaporate absurdly fast. And as I was doing this video, I realized that this could be an interesting topic for another video. Could we create a black hole that would eat up entire planet? See you there.